And we're going to introduce you to one of the um, contributors on the course, um, and it will be a very good friend of mine. Um, most of you would have probably met her when in various things that I've done on social media. She's a really great friend of mine, but most of you may or may not be aware that her actual background or her, her one of the massive parts of um, her, this individual, her name is Lou Holmes, is that she has a huge um, amount of experience and expertise in nose work. She is a, um, a search and rescue um, trainer. She has trained hearing dogs for the deaf. She's done a, a loads of different things, police dogs. She's trained police dog puppies. She's done a load of work in nose work. And the reason I asked Lou to be part of this project is because I felt there was a missing entity with once these dogs have um, some skills and core skills that I can help them with, and we're building their confidence. We need a vocation for these dogs so that they don't revert back to being problematic. The obvious choice for most people is to do something like nose work. Nose work is something that you can do largely on your own. You don't need a massive amount of equipment. You don't need a massive amount of resources. You can largely do it anywhere. You can start it in your living room. So it's really, really practical for most people to do um, with any type of dog, any breed of dog, any age of dog, any size of dog you can do. A lot of the other sports and I, you know, I partake in a lot of sports with my dogs. Um, there is a specific equipment involved. You need specific facilities. You need a certain, you know, um, there's certain restrictions and pros and cons, etc. Nose work is something that anybody can do. Lou was most definitely the um, obvious choice. She's a, as I said, she's had five, five search and rescue dogs that have qualified and have been out there doing it and literally saving people's lives. Um, and I wanted you guys to meet her and, and just have this dialogue. The other thing that's specific about Lou is that she had a dog called Chip, who I talked about in one of my blogs written about reactivity, who, again, I'm going to let her share a little bit of insight into him and introduce herself and what she's contributed to the course. So bear with me whilst I get Lou on the call. Hopefully she's here. Where are you, Lou? There you are. So let's put you on the spotlight. OK. Hey, Lou. So Hi. Hi, everybody. Hopefully everybody can see Lou. Um, I'm just going to make sure before we get into a bit of a chat that it's coming out on Facebook. So hopefully it's all good. I think there's a slight delay, but I think we're good. So welcome, Lou. Uh, one of my closest friends. Um, my daughter adores Lou. Um, I have to say it's a sideline <laughs> thing. Um, so I obviously asked Lou to be involved in this project because of her ex expertise. Lou, could you just share with people a little bit about your background and um, what you've done in terms of nose work and your role um, at, at present? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I grew up um, in Lancashire um, in a very lovely um, sort of town. My parents' neighbours, uh, the gentleman who lived next door to my parents, was very involved in mountain rescue with his dogs. Uh, and um, he had uh, four border collies and, and they were all sort of operational search dogs. And I used to get up every morning to go out for a walk with him, with, with his dogs, because I wasn't allowed my own dog. Um, so I used to set my alarm and go out for a walk with him with his dogs and then go off to school uh, and every weekend and evenings and things I'd badger him to take me along to the uh, to the search dog training and let me hide up on the hillsides and things and I I was deeply like fascinated by what the dogs could do how far away they could find how they did that how they trained them to do that uh, and then I think on a on a more human and personal level really resonated with me is that one of my very earliest memories was that he um he spent Christmas away from home with his dogs because um when there was the Lockerbie air crash um he went away with his search dogs and was involved in um in looking uh for people and um unfortunately remains of people up there. Uh, and I think from a very early age then, um, that ages me a little bit, but um, from an early age then, he... Um, Lou, your that, figure. Oh, that's it. Good. Yeah. And um, I was really sort of, um, you know, keen on doing nose work and things with dogs, exploring what they could do. Uh, when I left school, I went to, to actually work with horses. Uh, and then when I finished working with horses, um, I went to work at hearing dogs for deaf people, so training assistance dogs 
um, over there and working uh, with the dogs and the people, um, the deaf recipients of the dogs. Uh, whilst I was there, um, hearing dogs were approached to um, to form a group that uh, um, is now um, a charity in its own existence. But we were involved, a group of us and my first dog, uh, my dog that I had at the time there, um, in looking where the dogs could detect cancer um, in uh, your, from urine samples um, and um, doing a, a sort of pilot study on whether that was possible. Um, which again was um, was something that I was very heavily involved in, and coincided with that we um, we set up a team uh, in the Thames Valley area for search dogs, which was a new thing for lowland areas. Obviously, mountain rescue dogs have been around forever, um, but lowland rescue um, certainly didn't have dogs involved at the time, and Brock was the first qualified um, dog for for Lowland Rescue um, and since then um, I'm now my fifth dog is now in in training for um, for search and rescue work uh, and yeah as you say I've done um, police dog puppy walking and things I've worked with the police doing some picker training and things with them and tracking work and scent work nose work thing teaching dogs um, de uh, drugs detection and things through clicker training rather than some of the um, the more traditional methods that they used to use um, and, and now have my own business um, working with dogs, uh, pet tra training, uh, training people um, for different things, uh, as well as still being a very active member and uh, assessor with my search and rescue team. Amazing. So again, vastly experienced in the realms of nose work. And you can see that that's why Lou was such an obvious choice for somebody. Not only is she a really close friend, but she, her, her expertise in this area was something that I felt would be a great as, uh, uh, input and a part of this course. So Lou, specifically, I asked him, this is why uh, one of the other contributing factors of why I asked Lou to join this project was um, she had a dog I talked about, Chip. Chip was a crossbreed who had the potential, he had a very traumatic experience at a very young age. I go, if you go to my blog, um, uh, um, it's not a, a crack, it's a chip, um, where I talk about Lou specifically. I'm gonna let Shoot Lou just give us a little bit of insight into that story and what happened with Chip. And then we're gonna talk about what she's contributed to the course. So Lou, do you just wanna talk about, um, obviously I gave a little bit of lead in there with um, Chip. So just tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, sure. So, um, so Chip was a dog that I got uh, as a puppy. He was actually a repeat mating of um, my first search dog, Brock, uh, who I was desperately keen to have a repeat of because, you know, he was the best dog in the world. Um, and, um, uh, and you couldn't have asked for chalk and cheese more if you'd, if you'd done it. But, um, but uh, he did, Chip ha did have a, um, his reactivity was caused by uh, was definitely caused by trauma in that when he was about 10 weeks old, I took him to the park uh, with the other dogs that I had with me at the time. Uh, and we were in the park and a dog um, uh, came running across the park and pinned him to the floor and pretty much took half of his face off. And he was very lucky to sort of survive it and, um, and not actually need more doing than he did, but um, lots and lots and lots and lots of stitches later, uh, obviously he was understandably um, very upset by what had happened uh, and very traumatized by it. Obviously then consequently very reactive to other dogs. And um, I think that there was a lot, obviously, as you can imagine in that situation, a lot of like screaming and yelling. And so that made him actually quite fearful about people and things as well. Um, that he just sort of related the whole thing to, to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, he was, uh, he was not in a good place when uh, he recovered physically from that, uh, but mentally, obviously that took an, an awful lot longer. Uh, and I genuinely and wholeheartedly believe that had he not had a job to do, had we not been able to sort of channel uh, 
his abilities into something that he could do, he probably would have ended up having to be put to sleep. I'm almost certain he would have bitten somebody. Um, uh, just, just purely through fear and things. And uh, just um, explain the phenomenon of what would happen when he put his uniform slash jacket on when he was in that mode of doing something. No? Yeah, so he was always, um, so just as a general sort of pet dog, you, I always was obviously on, it got much better. I worked with it and it, and it did get better, but I was always on the watch out on walks. Uh, and actually he was, he was fine if you set off with a dog and we got him built his confidence and things. But if you met a dog suddenly coming around the corner, that, that terrified him and his, and his way of dealing with that was to actually go in himself. Um, but such was his um, his love and his sort of just became this completely different persona when you put a, a, a jacket on it. It was almost like, you know, Clark Kent becoming Superman. That He put his little cape on and he was unrecognisable as the same dog. You could literally go through throngs of people, throngs of dogs. Dogs could come up to him and he wouldn't even see them. It was like they were not there. Mm -hmm. uh, and like this, just this amazing transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you took the cape back off again mm -hmm. and he wasn't sort of on his job, then he was back to sort of, oh, okay, well, I've got to look out for this and I've got to look out for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then what over time, what happened? That, that working mentality bled into his domestics mm -hmm. and he ended up being like, I mean, he was the sweetest dog in the end, wasn't he? He was like, the dog that you'd use for stooge dogs he was yeah. amazing wasn't it because of that that using that that um negative energy and turning it and the big thing that i'd say was really lose forte was she didn't see the dog as a victim she saw the dog as okay this has happened how are we going to move it and i think that's lose strength as a trainer she doesn't see the dog as oh poor um um chip oh he you know he's had this atrocious thing i must protect him for the world she sort of went okay it's happened let's move forward. And that's something that I would urge everybody to take a leaf out of Lou's, Lou's book. Again, she's, um, I write about her specifically in um, the blog, if you want to go and look to that. Anybody that um, signs up for the Relabeling Reactivity course, there is will be an ebook in which I um, cover, part of that will be some of the blogs, and there's a stack of information in that ebook. The ebook is also going to be available separately to the course. So if you uh, can't, you know, um, partake in the course at this moment, the ebook's going to be available. That will be launched next week. So the reason why I asked Lou to um, contribute, one, because of her experience, two, in terms of nose work, two, because she's been in the position that many of you are presently or may have been with a dog that could have a problem. Um, and she's walked the walk and talked the talk. But also the benefits that she just articulated about nose work for a dog that either lacks confidence. Just explain to people um, why you believe that nose work is so beneficial. Um, and just, again, give everybody a brief outline of what you've contributed to the course. Yeah, sure. So um, all dogs use their nose. It's something that every single dog uh, on this planet does um, on an on a almost daily basis. Um, and so we were able, it's really easy to channel that into something that they uh, that they really enjoy doing uh, and to give them that outlet through then um, working their brain. So it's great for dogs that are um, maybe less mobile if they've got a physical injury and things, uh, as well as for dogs that, that are fit as a fiddle, but um, you know, you maybe can't let them off in as many places as others because of, because of their issues or um, reactivities and things. Um, and there's always something that you can get them to um, to look for and to channel that into. Um, I was just seeing that there was a comment on the uh, on Facebook about that they would really like to do some nose work and things with their dog, but they're worried about people. Well, that doesn't matter. You can teach a dog to find anything, and we can, you know, really channel that. Um, I do um, scent work classes for my pet dog people and things, um, and and. Um, we have uh, we've had dogs in the past there that have been worried about people, um, and so we, you know it's not people that we get those dogs to look for, um, and so the content that I've provided for this course um, for you um, is broken down into three areas. So nose work, looking for um, uh, things um, which we start off with food uh, or with a toy. 
uh, and we can we can build that up to that you're uh, getting them to look for a specific scent. So it might be garlic clove, it might be um, gun oil, it could be literally anything. We've had we've done money with some dogs at um, pet dog training class. That's always popular. Getting them to to search out the ten pound notes, um, uh, and then there's also a tracking section to the course content. So. Um, teaching the dogs to follow a track again that doesn't that doesn't necessarily need to be somebody else so that can be a track that you've laid yourself um, and the dog's following that uh, so if they're wary and things about people there's not that that sort of pressure on them that they've got to deal with finding a person at the end of it um, and and also a man trailing section so uh, if they're okay with um with people or we can build them up to being um to being a lot better with people um there's a man trailing uh section to it as well so that's following specific scent of a specific person um and so the three areas that we've sort of covered in the course yeah excellent and then as i say i'm, I'm massively um excited about what lou's going to bring to the table mainly because of one as i say she's her experience and and she's literally done this with a dog that had a major yeah. potential major issue so a huge huge asset to the course um so the just to give you a brief and i know some of you have asked questions um i'm going to go over that at the end of, once everybody's con um, done there um you've met each of the people that have contributed i'm just mindful of the time and i know um uh, Christina, she's she's joining us from America and she um, is on a different time zone. So uh, and we're going to come to her shortly um, and allow her to just to guys to meet her. So thank you very much, Lou. I massively appreciate You're welcome. What you've done, and I'm excited about everybody that's watching, getting to know you better and glean from your knowledge. OK.